Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's BU Professional Development Webinar, Burnout Busters, Restorative Strategies for Helping Professionals. My name is Dan Gardner, and I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by Boston University Alumni Relations and is offered to our 335,000 alumni all around the globe. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. I know we have alumni joining us today from far away places like Mumbai, Taipei, Athens, Mountain View, California, St. Louis, Missouri, Denver, Colorado, Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and as always, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Upton, Boxford, Stoughton, Boston, and many more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion and feedback and on this and every program that we offer. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, just some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on our Zoom online meeting platform. And if you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of the presentation, we're going to ask that you please contact Zoom support. You can see their phone number on the screen, uh, and it's 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website, and you can find it at bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer the questions that you have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A box. You can find it by hovering over either the top or bottom of your screen and selecting Q&A. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, Sargent College alumna, Lynn Festa. Lynn graduated from Boston University with a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy. She has been a clinician specializing in hand therapy for over 30 years. Feeling disillusioned and burnout back in 2012, Lynn set out to find solutions to this growing issue in today's environment. Lynn now combines her work as an occupational therapist with positive psychology to provide training to other professionals in promoting wellness and limiting burnout. She attained her certificate in positive psychology from the Whole Being Institute and is a certified Daring Way facilitator through the Daring Way. She has presented on topics related to burnout in healthcare, resilience, and work-life balance at national and international conferences, webinars like this one, keynotes, and many group workshops as well. She is the owner of Health Professional Coaching, and uh, she's also a clinical consultant at Berkshire Hand and Shoulder Center. Now, Lynn, thank you so much for being here today, and I'm happy to say the floor is all yours. Wonderful, Dan. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your time. Um, a short bio of, um, you already heard some of it. The one thing that I want to point out that I was um, a BU women's ice hockey uh, player from 1986 to 1988. So my, my water bottle, um, formerly known as a beer stein, um, is from the 1987 ninth annual women's bean pot. Um, so I uh, yes, a proud uh, proud uh, graduate of um, Sargent College and Boston University. Um, as you can see, the thing that I left out of the formal introduction was um, being um, an OTD dropout. Um, being as competitive as I am, <laughs> um, I did not get the record for the least amount of time um, spent in a graduate degree, which was three days. Um, but what I found was that wasn't uh, where my life was supposed to go. And having found myself disillusioned at that time, somehow this, this work found me. Um, if you want to know about my alter ego, you can um, check out the website below. So the key points of the presentation, and there are, um, this is uh, a, a lot of information. Um, and normally these talks are done in, um, six hours. <laughs> so there was a lot of editing to be done to bring it down to about 40 to 45 minutes. But the key points of this presentation are defining what is a helping professional, what is burnout. And my goal today, um, and my intention of today, is to make sure that I send you away with tools that you actually start using um, this afternoon. 
So how do we define a helping professional? It actually is a pronoun. And it's basically anybody who is other focused, meaning you go into your profession or your calling or your vocation with the intent to serve it forward. So it, it doesn't, um, it could be obviously healthcare. And Dan, actually, we have the poll questions to get a sense of um, who is here. Um, and that gives me a sense of um, the audience. So we just, I wanted to get a sense of how many years experience people have and what is your primary vocation, so. And everyone should see that poll on their screen now. You can go ahead and vote. We'll wait just a couple more seconds as, yeah. as the votes are, are coming in and then I'll go ahead and share those results. So again, the first question, in what field is your primary vocation? And the second one, how many years of experience do you have? It looks like results are slowing down. So I'll go ahead and share those results with all of you. Okay, very good. So a lot of education, excellent. Um, a lot of other, that makes me happy. That's great because again, this is for anybody who, um, who approaches their work as a calling with the intent to help others. So that's fantastic. Um, I love how I thought when I started this work, I would be um, speaking to people like myself who have been in the field for a few years. I make the joke that I started hand therapy when I was four. Um, but I'm finding that I love that the younger population, you guys, zero to five years, um, is really paying attention to this work. That's, that's fantastic. Very good. So we can close that and move on. So what I love about this is, again, going back to a helping professional and why we choose to do the vocation that we do. Most of the time, especially what I saw from that poll, is we're not making um, a salary with a lot of zeros behind it. We're doing it because we want to be a purpose. And I love the idea of the servant leader was first um, first described by Robert Greenleaf, and it says it begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve and to serve first. So I, I love that that's the sense of, of what we're doing here. Now, this slide goes in absolutely every presentation that I do because I do work with professionals. Um, I do work individually with people, but it's about their profession. And I think this one is very important because it's a J-O-B that we're showing up for and there's certain um, responsibilities and duties that we need to respect at our jobs. This is important because a lot of times when people describe burnout, they lump compassion fatigue in with burnout. And I think it's very important to really separate the two out. Um, the, the treatments are kind of similar, but the causes are different. So sometimes there's just a different approach to this. And compassion fatigue is just being really emotionally worn out from witnessing so much suffering. Um, this can be seen a lot in ICU, ICU nurses. That's actually very common. And it's a very, um, it's a very uh, easy explanation example of this. And also people, again, who are um, doing volunteer and work overseas in very um, dire situations, or you're just in a situation where you just, there's so much, um, there's so much that goes on. Um, a, a, lesser, a lesser example of this is watching the news so much. Um, and unfortunately, there's always something um, um, happening, that sometimes we can, we can get compassion fatigue from that. That is different from burnout. A lot of the work is done by Maslick, Christina Maslick and Michael Leder, and they came up with um, six different variables on your job that can lead to the burnout. Um, the first one is the lack of control, and that's a lot how much input do you really have in what's going on. Um, are you being micromanaged? Um, are you having, is there an ineffective leader or ineffective teams that you really just don't have control over? Insufficient reward, of course, um, getting paid for what we do or not, working overtime and not getting paid for it which is actually illegal um, in most places, but we won't go there. Um, and a lot of times it's just not hearing a thank you. It's not just the acknowledgement. So that's more of an intrinsic um, reward that sometimes you sometimes just want to hear. 
work overload. I know we can spend way too much on this. Um, for those of us in healthcare, uh, work overload, especially with the EMRs. Um, I say that um, anybody who can develop um, a medical uh, EMR system needs the Nobel Prize because they're really going to do us all a huge justice. So any of you young engineers out there, there's your ticket. Um, unfairness. Sometimes unfairness could be um, uh, a Perceived inequities on the job. Um, sometimes there's um, discrimination, there's disrespect, or maybe there's just plain old favoritism, which you know is unfortunately alive and well in 2019. The community, the breakdown of the community is again leadership, leadership, leadership. It comes from the top, um, and uh, that's yeah. Um, those are the people that I, I love to work with first because they all have such a direct effect on um, their, their teams. Um, but also your relationship with your colleagues or just general communication, there's a breakdown. Now, as an occupational therapist, we feel very strongly about values. I do a lot of work with values um, uh, because that's really what we bring into our jobs is our value system. And a lot of times there's just actually the number one thing is the conflict with the values. Uh, burnout is real. Um, there's a lot of um, awful side effects. This slide is obviously a little bit geared towards more um, healthcare professionals, but you can, um, patient satisfaction can also be client or student satisfaction for those of you in education. Um, the quality of your care will definitely go down, which will also lead to an increase in um, errors. And if you're a physician or somebody who is in that position where um, there's malpractice, um, that actually increases um, actually significantly. And it's not so much about the um, something goes wrong. Obviously, something goes wrong for some, there to be a malpractice suit. But a lot of times, it's because of how the patient perceived they were treated, which is really interesting. Um, and they will pick up, patients pick up on the quality of care and your attitude. Um, increased costs for any sort of turnover is very costly to systems. It's on one and a half times, if you're replacing a nurse, um, the statistic is one and a half times the cost of the nurse to replace that nurse. Um, the one that is very alarming to me is the last one, is there's an increase of substance abuse by 25%. So a little bit of background about burnout. I actually found this very interesting. It was first described by, i get this name right, Herbert Frudenberger in 1974. And he started to study the people who were working with um, um, clients with substance abuse. So yeah, it's still an ongoing awful issue that we're all dealing with. And it's fascinating that th these clients were first described as burnouts. Um, and what it became is then they started studying these people, the, the clinicians and the social workers working with these people, and it became, I am burnt out. So um, I really wanted to be an English major, but I, I'm, I'm an OT, very happy for it. But it went from being a pronoun a noun to being a verb, so I am burnt out. There are lots of different stages. There's a lot of information um, on burnout. There's stages. I, I decided that there was no reason to go through the different stages. Just know that um, there's anywhere from four to 12. Um, burnout, it's not a distinct order, means it's, um, it's not a psychiatric condition, but it does have an ICD-10 code, which um, means that, which is wonderful, because then it means that it actually can start to be um, dealt with um, by insurance. And then I'm moving my, um, my little video to show you the code in case anybody would like to uh, investigate that. And like what I talked about in the last slide, that's a 300 with a B billion is it cost the U.S. economy. And the one thing that we um, want to make sure that we talk about is that this is vocation and work related. Oh, hold on. If I do that. So I love this slide because it's really important permission to be human. A lot of the work with Brene Brown, which you'll I will um, intersperse in throughout this, is we automatically, our brains, it's really not our fault, are geared towards a negativity bias. We will look for the negative to the positive, and it's actually as high as 12 to 1, which is kind of depressing. Um, but it's not really your fault if you find yourself looking for your brain going towards what, um, what is wrong versus what is right, which is why I really love the study of positive psychology. Um, 
so th this is, um, again, it's, it's not our fault. Even if you define yourself that you're an optimistic person, it's just how we're wired. So I want to definitely discuss some um, assessment tools, which I said I would. The gold standard is the one done by um, Christina Maslick and Michael Leder, and it's called the Maslick Burnout Inventory. Um, it's highly reliable. Um, the, it's the gold standard. Um, online, I expected just to find out MaslickBurnoutInventory.com, and actually that doesn't exist. So the best place that I found this information was on that website, if you'd like to investigate that further. This inventory is actually mostly used, because it is actually fairly expensive, it is mostly used for research, but um, it's really wonderful. One that um, is, is right off the web is the Professional Quality of Life Assessment. And um, this one I actually love because this website is fantastic. There, it's free, 24 languages. They make a point of it being free. They ask for feedback. Um, if you're somebody who wants to present with this material, they're like, here, use our slides. Just tell us how we can make them better. Um, talk about um, serving the work forward. So um, this is something that if you have a group of people that you're doing this work with um, it actually works quite well I did it with a group of um, I had a workshop in the fall and I had I did it with a hundred people and it is very very accessible and it gives you a wonderful snapshot of burnout versus compassion satisfaction and it rules out that compassion fatigue too this book I guess take a sip from my bean pot mug This book is fantastic. Um, um, the Resilient Practitioner, I can't say enough good things about it. And then also seeing that we have a younger population um, in this book, what really struck me with this was how they spoke about the new practitioner and the novice or novice or new practitioner and the anxiety that um, that practitioner experiences. So, so I love that it brings it back to that. Um, what I love about this too is it's um, highly accessible. There is no, again, there is no one website to put down. So just Google this and it's a self inventory where you go through and you give it a score. And it also asks you some questions to kind of give you a sense of where you're at. So when we do the three dimensions of burnout, the three that are most classic is the word that I will use um, are the ones there. Um, the one, if there's anybody um, who is um, a leader and responsible for numbers, um, I think I would pay extra attention to the third one and that's where you start to have decreased productivity and decreased performance. Um, the first one is obviously you're just beat and all of these crazy side effects, you know, like a bad commercial, um, so insomnia, fatigue, um, you name it comes up. Depersonalization is where you're starting to kind of isolate yourself. So again, if you're in charge of people or feel like you want to really be good about um, facing your own music, figure out if you're starting to isolate yourself more than you used to. So, again, in my work, because I love research, I don't do research, but I love researching this and, and then synthesizing it and doing it here, was a work of Jesus Montero Marin. He's a clinical um, PhD psychologist out of Spain. So, yes, half of his papers are in Spanish, but again, a lot of it's in English too. Um, did, came up with something called burnout syndrome. And basically, Burnout is the opposite of engagement. Again, he has his three words that he uses. They're actually quite similar, but everyone's got to come up with their own. My, um, my uh, two-second version of burnout is um, what you see in the cartoon. So what I really love about Dr. Marin's work, um, again, we just don't want to take everything, this is how you solve burnout. Well, actually, we need to take a closer look at the client or the patient like we would as occupational therapists or providers and kind of get a sense of where this is coming from. Um, so there are, he came up with three clinical subtypes for burnout. Um, the interesting thing is how he did his research was the questionnaire at the bottom 
I found that online. I could not find how he scored it. So I got the sense that um, he was using this questionnaire, which is uh, has very, it was found to be very reliable and valid um, to kind of get a sense of these. So let me break these down for you. Could this kind of gets into, yes, but how can this make me better? So the first one is the frenetic subtype, and these are the um, type A people. I guess that term isn't used quite as much. Um, they, they really come across as workaholics, very involved. Um, the biggest thing that helps me connect and figure out if somebody comes from a frenetic background um, is recovering perfectionists speak for myself on that. But their identity is really tied to their career. So if you speak to these people and you say, I go in America, we're not really actually supposed to ask this question, but we're supposed to say, so what do you do? And they, instead of answering like, oh, I run, I sew, I, they're very focused in on their career. So as being a um, coach, I've actually switched that sentence to, um, so what do you do for fun? What do you do that brings you joy? Again, that brings you back to the fact that they say, I, I, I work, I don't do anything. This may be somebody that has a strong identity to their career and will definitely um, burn out. So treatment approaches um, for the frenetic type, and I'm gonna break down the self-compassion and the boundaries a little bit um, after we're done going through the different subtypes. So hold tight for those. Um, the biggest thing with this, with, when I'm working with somebody that comes from this um, clinical subtype is basically I, I give them assignment that they gotta go get a life. Just do something for yourself. I don't care if it's five sit-ups a day, you walk around the block once. Um, obviously, you stay away from substance abuse, but you get them to get a life. The second one is um, what's called the under-challenged subtype. And, um, and, and the one thing I, I want to make sure I, I say about these different subtypes is they can be fluid. Um, those of us who have been in the field for a while will know that I can kind of identify with um, each of these. Maybe this is what in 2012 I was challenged and, and the clinical doctor, it was not for me, but I just found myself, um, I'm going to say it, I was bored. Um, but what happened, then not willing to sit with that, um, I'm happy to say um, I'm here doing this work. But I, I, um, they, these, this clinical subtype doesn't seem to have a whole lot of work to do. And I, I like nicknaming people. And one of the nicknames that I um, kind of give to this is a Tom Sawyer. Like these are the people that actually get you to paint the fence and you find yourself painting the fence. Um, this is seen typically more in large organizations. Um, so, uh, the treatment approach is for the under-challenged. You really need a project. Um, hopefully, you have um, a leader that's paying attention or manager is paying attention to this and kind of get them, understand if you're the leader, understand that this person's there because they're burnt out. We're going to give them the benefit of the doubt um, and say, hey, you know, let's develop a new skill set. Let's bring this forward. Um, the bottom is uh, the expectations need to be met. Again, this is the J-O-B. Um, you are getting paid. Um, so that's this is the best way to kind of reignite the person who has become under-challenged. Um, I think there's some of us who can um, really identify with the boots on the left. Um, those boots started out really energetic. So I like to quote a chorus line, like, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball. And we were so excited when we started out. Um, but then so we're just really tired. Um, that's where we developed something called the learned helplessness. Um, that was um, uh, Marty Seg Segelman's work before he actually started positive psychology. That was his term was that sense of like, no matter what I do, it's not going to change anything. And this is really dangerous because these people, um, those of us who are worn out, will start to, that's where the medical errors start to come in. So the biggest thing I do, again, with people who are worn out is permission slips. And that's a big thing from the work of Dr. Brene Brown is a permission slip. Permission slip to say, I'm beat and I need rest. Um, and then we're going to go through all of these um, other things in a moment. But a lot of it has to do with some of um, coping skills, which 
we are going to start to jump into right now. So the work of resilience, um, we see that word a lot. And we see that word a lot because it's actually really important. Um, uh, resilience can be uh, developed. Um, the goal, um, according to the literature, if you can get your response um, down to two to 20 minutes and um, not that perseveration, it's um, when something happens to us, your response time to that situation is within two to 20 minutes. But yes, this is definitely a learned behavior. Um, I read something along the way. This is something about 7,000 hours. I don't know. They just made that up. But the point is, um, it is learned and it does take some time. Um, distress tolerance is like how much you can really put up with. But um, what I think is really great that comes out of developing our resilience, especially through so, some of these tools, are the work by Tedeschi and Calhoun on post-traumatic growth. So to use an example of post-traumatic growth for myself was it was 2012, and here I had had this wonderful, wonderful um, career as a hand therapist, and I just really wanted to chuck it. Like I went and told everybody I was mentoring and training. I'm like, learn fast because I'm going to run off and do life coaching and be a sports life coach because that was where I was at. But my point of that was I had this crisis, vocational crisis that led to this post-traumatic growth. So that's a wonderful example of um, how you can take something and something good comes out of it. So Again, I'm really aging myself here, but um, the uh, what is resilience? What I like is there. Let me move this. Is the first di the first definition is from the American Psychology Association. I have this thing about not reading slides. Um, the second one is from the Greater Good Science Center, which I'll talk um, a little bit more in a moment. But it's really about. Um, um, responding and um, and bouncing back, which um, I, I love. Okay, I'm aging myself. These were um, designed in 1971, and there are the Weeble Wobbles, and there were these big things that you would go, and especially as a little kid, would go and push them as hard as you could, and they would falter, but they would always find their way back to center. To me, that's the most wonderful, fun definition of resilience. Hold on, would I move something? Oh. So this, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and this was taken from the work of the Greater Good Science Center, which is a nonprofit organization out of Berkeley that I cannot say enough great things about. Um, they do. It's all nonprofit. They work on donations. Um, I'm currently taking a certificate program through them that is offering a lot of wonderful material. So if, again, if you're looking to do a deeper dive into some of this, please check them out. Um, uh, certificates programs like happiness at work. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. How awesome. But I think this, this is incredibly important slide um, that these are their words. Um, but it's again, it's not being bullied and it's not always dealing with awful. That's not saying that's building a resilience. That's crossing the line. Another thing that, um, let me, so self-care is how you take your power back if you can't read that whole slide. Oh, man, I love that. Because when I, when I went to OT school, we our elevator speech of, as occupational therapists is like, well, we help our clients balance between work, play, and self-care. And um, 30 to 35 years ago, self-care was really about tying your shoes and brushing your teeth and functioning in the world. I downplayed that. I'm sorry to any OTs in the world. But that was self-care was about that. It was the work and the play. But what I love about now, because it's a buzzword, again, people are starting to use it, practice your self-care. I'm like, okay, wait, wait a minute. But what I love is it's like a deliberate action to look out for yourself. And that helps me to own it. Okay. So, okay, good. Okay, so we're definitely going to do um, a little bit of a discussion about boundary setting. I have to say, um, probably close to most 100% of everybody that I coach, we end up talking about boundaries because people who tend to go into the helping professions, people on this, um, are, for better or for worse, people pleasers, um, and we're there 
to make the world a better place, but we're kind of people pleasers and we um, don't always know to set boundaries. I will say some of this is some of the work from Brene Brown. When you, if you're somebody who hasn't been setting good boundaries um, and you start to set good boundaries, there will be pushback. You will feel uncomfortable, but know that it's absolutely worth it and know that that's taking your power back. You'll know that you haven't set a boundary when you find yourself um, resentful or feeling like the victim of the situation. You haven't set a clear boundary. Hold on, let me catch on to this. Click, click. So again, some quotes from Brene Brown. Is you my we are okay? You ask. I love this, is that you're willing to use no as a complete sentence when somebody asks you to do it. Um, again, back to being the people pleaser, but when you're getting taken advantage of, then a boundary has been crossed. Um, the last line, again, is a direct quote from Brene Brown. I have used this when I'm setting a boundary, and I feel like when there's people that all of a sudden I'm setting a boundary with I haven't set before, will make everybody pretty uncomfortable. And they'll look at you like, but Lynn, you always do that. And I will find myself, don't cave, don't cave, don't shrink, don't puff up, stand your sacred ground. And I will say that as a loop in my head until the situation dissipates itself. Again, having said that, um, that's a result of teaching people how to treat us. Um, one of the quotes that I got from the O Magazine a, a while ago um, that I actually, I use all the time when I find myself, oh, wait a minute, maybe I didn't set a boundary on this situation, is what you permit, you promote. So you're encouraging that ties back into that first sentence as we teach people how to treat us. If you're permitting them to put all of these things on your schedule or, or kind of running crazy on you, you're permitting that. So when you're permitting it, you're promoting that. Um, the, the third one I love, but I highly recommend that you don't say this at work. That make this That's crossing into insubordination and may get you fired. Um, but you can definitely say it to yourself, and that may be one of your mantras if you're getting new to saying no and sorry, I'm not sorry. A lot of times, too, is um, the work of Byron Katie. Um, I, I love her work. There's not a lot of science to it, but if you do want to argue, it could be level five level of evidence of clinical expertise. And the question that she always asks when, when you're um, in a situation that you're starting to feel resentful about, about them, the question is, is whose business are you in? And you'll and the person will be like, well, what do you mean? I'm upset that they're doing this. I'm like, no, you're upset that they're doing this. Stay in your own business. That's a mantra too. Okay. Wonderful work that's been done um, by Kristen Neff um, is incredibly important. Again, normally these, um, this is just um, a tasting of um, burnout things, but the work of self-compassion uh, works incredibly well with um, people who are experiencing burnout. And her work is, I think she's in Texas now, um, is based on common humanity, kindness, and yes, we will talk about mindfulness. <laughs> Self-compassion is um, uh, decreases our cortisol levels, which will help with um, chronic stress, um, which actually wears us down and leads to the burnout. Um, it's about, uh, it also will increase our resilience that we talked about and making the, the um, bouncing back from situations uh, much cleaner and much faster. I also love this because the only way we're going to succeed is to fail. Um, and I think the more that we practice self-compassion, the more willing we're, we're more willing to, as Martha Beck says, fail spectacularly. So the first one is common humanity. Is that when something, some an issue is going on, sometimes we can have the feeling that you're all, you're alone and you're and you're the only one that's ever experienced this, and I I can't believe this. Well, you're not. Um, 
reach out to anybody and I promise you, you will find somebody who has experienced the situation that you're in and recognize that you're not alone. Um, I also uh, love, again, as a recovering perfectionist, which is why this work is so helpful to me, is um, it's, uh, we can be uh, perfectly imperfect. So sometimes I just start to quote Mary, when in doubt, quote Mary Poppins. Kindness. I know it seems so simple, but yes, I know it's what the world needs. Um, but this one I think is important for those of us who tend to kind of be very um, hard on ourselves is talking to yourself like you would a close friend and see if you catch yourself, you know, saying, oh my God, could you be more stupid or something like that? Now, let me ask you this. If you had a friend who said, who spoke to you like that, would you keep that friend? Um, I'm going to hope not. Um, so talk to yourself like you would a close friend and watch what happens. So mindfulness, I know we have to touch on it. Um, but I love how uh, Kristen makes this a part of being um, uh, self-compassionate is being mindful. And it's about responding and just not automatically reacting. It's about staying non-judgmental um, and just kind of um, facing things as they are. Yeah, mindfulness has completely taken off, and I think it's fantastic. Um, I am approaching this from the, um, the side of the burnout and being in a busy clinic and things like that. So there's definitely mindfulness programs. They're fantastic. That's great. I'm talking about, like, you're in the trench with no supplies and how mindfulness can come through and help you. As you can see, um, there's lots of people with lots of ideas. Um, all of these are under a second. There's millions of, and there's lots of wonderful information. I think this is important too, because what it's not, um, it's not any of these things. It's also not numbing. Um, and numbing is when you do something, um, it's eating um, 10 cookies instead of one cookies and, and that you're not being mindful if you're numbing yourself to start to feel better. Um, it's not avoiding. Okay. The work of Bishop and all. Um, really, I think, again, there's a lot of stuff on what is mindful. Of course, um, uh, Kabat-Zinn has his wonderful one. I liked this because I just really like the evidence. Um, of what mindfulness is written by Bishop and all in 2004. I think a wonderful way to get you back into being mindful is um, a mantra. Um, the one that I find when I start to get a little bit frenetic and not a uh, little bit caught up is go back, when in doubt, go to the Wizard of Oz and surrender Dorothy. Um, you can see the other two. Um, namaste right here. I took off from a shirt. Um, I was at uh, the Kripalu, um Yoga Retreat, which is about two miles from where I live, which is kind of cool. But there is this, and people are walking around being very yoga-ish, and that's great. But there was this one girl who had um, this t-shirt on and sweats, and she said, namaste in bed. And I thought, you go, girl. So I took that, and it's like, namaste right here when I find that I need to really check back in and start to be mindful. Again, going for the response, not that initial knee-jerk reaction. Okay, good. I'm timing myself. Um, this is, again, this is really important about, you know, we don't, if we're in the helping profession, we're running. There's some days I remember I'm like, oh, look, I got to pee, and maybe I didn't get lunch. Um, Again, that's going to lead to burnout, but if we can sneak, start to sneak some things in, this will help. Um, I know it sounds funny to exhale, but all of the work on mindfulness talked about breathing, and I'm like, yeah, no, no kidding. Um, and, but what they're really talking about, and it's also a neurophysiological thing, is to actually take three it's the exhale that's so important. It's like in swimming now. Um, like you got to exhale. Um, that's what's important. So if you're really caught up in nothing, exhale. Mindfulness on the job is also keeping strict boundaries. Again, people will catch on that you're not going to be, you know, the Tom Sawyer's will catch on that you're not going to paint the fence. Um, multitasking. 
okay, this is actually incredibly important. So I'm going to take a minute to discuss multitasking. Again, we have our phones, we have all of these things. We do now know in the literature that multitasking doesn't end well. Um, it has been shown to increase errors by 50% uh, when you start to multitask. So you might want to think twice about doing two things at once, especially if it's um, well, taking care of other people. The other thing is that a list and managers, it will decrease the productivity by 40%. It also will start to increase our stress cortisol levels, which again is no help. Um, so funny, when I started doing this, I'm like, oh, I don't multitask till I realized I do. And then I stopped. And the other thing that this caught me that I was very guilty of is when I was in the clinic, the how much was I interrupting other people when I didn't really need to interrupt them? Which gets to the next thing is to get into the flow, uh, the work of Chick Sent Me High, um, and flow of being in your work will obviously help decreasing your burnout. But every time you go and interrupt somebody, you're stopping them and you're doing all of those negative things. Again, um, I've worked places where they're like, take a walk, uh, go meditate, which is great. I do meditate. I love it. I swear by the Deepak Opera, um, 21 free meditations. If you're new to meditation, sign up for those. They're addicting. Um, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you really just have two minutes to like crank it out on the stairs. And then again, go back to the work of self-compassion. Okay, so this is, um, um, this is also incredibly important. I know it's hard to leave work at work, but we really owe it to those we love and those around us who are trying to be supportive that you start to do this. And a wonderful way to do this, especially if you find yourself in the habit of um, constantly venting, and that's, that's the energy that then you're bringing to your loved ones, um, as you write down the issue before you leave work um, and you write it, you don't type it. Um, I would also keep it in a journal that's kept locked because it may not say great things about some people that are next to you, you know, or use never use so never write somebody's name down. Ooh, never. Um, but write it down and that kind of helps you to get it out of your system. Again, not typing because then there's also the paper trail online. And then the limit, the venting to two minutes. And actually the word that I really use for this is limit the vomiting to two minutes because you're having a bad day. You walk in and you basically have this bad day and your significant other or your roommates or whoever is there and you take the bad day and you vomit up the bad day. Well, you feel better, but then this person is now covered in your vomit. And we're trying to be supportive, but that doesn't, that's not going to help your relationship. Um, I read this article that said, oh, you can talk for 15 minutes. And I thought, 15 minutes? I would, oh my God. First of all, if you have to talk for 15 minutes, something else is going on. And I can't imagine being that person to listen to for 15 minutes. So what I would do is you get a timer, like I have to make sure that I'm staying on time. And you say, I got a vent or I got a vomit. And that person goes and gets the timer and says, okay, go. That person will actively listen. You felt listened to. But at that two-minute time, you're done. And again, I know this sounds crazy, but God forbid, plan something for you, even if it's five or ten minutes. It will start to add up, and that will become addicting too. Um, so if you are a leader, if you're the manager, um, I can't stress enough that the better that you are um, and the more uh, positive the energy that you bring into what you do, your team uh, will follow suit. Um, so if you are a leader and you want to make your team better, again, positive psychology, making things how to flourish, um, go back and take these um, Take these inventories and see where you are. Examine your behavior and your general attitude. Are you bringing that energy in that's positive or are you bringing that energy in of, of negative? Sit down with your staff and ask, how are you really? And really listen. Now, again, be careful of going into the vomiting. Um, that make a list of problems, but then make a list of possible solutions. And that goes back to the slide at the beginning of burnout, of being lack of control. Again, maybe just giving your staff um, the ability to get control over one thing may have this trickle-down effect. 
Again, model the behavior, take the time off. Um, don't work through lunch all the time if you can help it. Stop multitasking. If you have a servant leader, whether you, you, know, you have a manager or not, um, know that we are all responsible for ourselves at the end of the day too, but go ahead and take that inventory. I cannot stress enough that you need to take a wellness day, and I would actually recommend that you would start to take them quarterly if you can. If nothing else, the anticipation of looking forward to that day where you're doing something for you and you know that you're not going to be in the office or in the clinic, and it's something fun to look forward to. Make, make your own list of what, what's going on. You know, are you burnt out because you're frenetic or you're not challenged or whatever the situation may be for you. And the last line just quotes Kenny Rogers. Not every situation is going to work. And sometimes you need to know when to call it. Um, I'm actually going to, well, we'll do this one. Um, then there's a video that I want to share that I, I just love. <laughs> Um, this is an exercise that I came up when I find myself in the days where my head's on the steering wheel and I'm like, oh God, I got to go in there. Um, and I just can't, is switch it back, take my me and my ego out of the situation and say, how can I best serve this day? Something will happen. And that reprograms your mind that you're going to start looking for something positive that's going to happen. And then at the end of the day, you can't leave. And if you really want to bring a team together, have this on a whiteboard of like, you can't leave until somebody comes up with the best moment. And I promise you, when you start looking for the best moment, it will be there. Um, oh, so a few of my, a few of my favorite things, I won't start singing. Um, these, uh, these are wonderful books. Um, if you want to deep dive into Resilient, uh, the work by Rick Hansen. He also has wonderful email uh, that come off and uh, that come to you, I think, every two weeks or something. It's very reasonable. And his work is fantastic. Um, uh, highly researched. Um, Sharon Salzberg, this book I just, I got and I highlighted probably the whole thing. Um, keeping a copy of this is just wonderful. The Empathy Effect is also um, a wonderful book written by an MD out of Mass General and has done wonderful work. Uh, when in doubt, the four agreements, can't go wrong with that. Um, so let's get this to work. So think of this as a three-minute meditation and, and, and sitting still. Maybe the hardest part is you... If you if you teach, you have to live your teaching. Mm. You can't uh, say, you do not as I do, but do as I say. No, no. You have to say, I'm doing my best to live what I teach. I have a painting by Phoebe of a group that she calls Sister Suki's Funeral. And they all the women, there are about nine women, and they, they all look like women in my grandmother's uh, prayer meeting group. So whenever I'm obliged to do something, I take that painting, and I look at that painting, there's an empty chair, and I think, now what would grandma do? What would she say? I can almost hear her voice say, now sister, you know what's right. Just do right. You don't really have to ask anybody. The truth is, right may not be expedient. It may not be profitable, but it will satisfy your soul. It brings you the kind of protection that bodyguards can't give you. Try to be all you can be, to be the best human being you can be. Try to be that in your church, in your temple, Try to be that in your classroom. Do it because it is right to do. You see, people will know you. 
and they will add their prayers to your life. They'll wish you well. I think if your name is mentioned and people say, oh, hell, oh, damn, <laughs> I think you're doing something wrong. But if your name is mentioned and people say, oh, she's so sweet, he's so nice, oh, I love, oh, God bless her. There you are. So try to live your life in a way that you will not regret years of useless virtue and inertia and timidity. Take up the, uh, the battle. Take it up. It's yours. This is your life. This is your world. I'll be leaving it long before you under the ordinary set of circumstances. You make your own choices. You can decide life isn't worth living. And that would be the worst thing you can do. How do you know? So far. Try it. See. So pick it up. Pick up the battle and, and make it a better world. Just where you are. Yes. And it can be better. And it must be better. But it is up to us. Ah. Uh. All right, so it's um, we have a few minutes left. Um, that's the end of my talk. I appreciate your time. I am going to stay on the line um, for a little bit, and I'll try to get my um, uh, my face back up there too. Um, but these are ways to reach me if you um, would like. Um, um, if you would like my reference list from this, I'd be happy to share that with you. Please email me. Um, you can find me on the website, linfested.com. Or if you really know me, you'll find me on the water, in the water, by the water. So thank you so much for your attention. And thank yeah. you so much, Lynn. I, I do want to say we have a couple minutes here before we hit the top of the hour. And of course, we want to be respectful of uh, everyone's time who's on the webinar. So we will try to wrap right at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, but if you did have any questions um, that you know you were hoping uh, to ask Lynn while we're still here, you can go ahead and submit those questions in the Q&A box. Um, one thing that occurred to me uh, is, you know, at the very beginning of the presentation when you were talking about uh, that pro uh, professional quality of life mm -hmm. uh, inventory, and you said, you know, it's this snapshot in time. Uh, so if, you know, if I'm a professional out working and I take that inventory, uh, how long should I wait until maybe I take it again to see if we're, you know, moving in a new direction, making progress? Uh, do you think it takes three months, six months, maybe a year? Um, uh, what would you what would you recommend in terms of timing? Oh, that's a great question, and I don't think anybody's actually um, asked that. Um, I would actually, um, because I do outcome studies all the time with my patients, it, it varies. So I would do it at least every three months because you want to see, um, get a sense of where numbers are changing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Great All right. That's great. And uh, we, we did have a couple of folks asking, uh, you know, if the presentation will be available. Uh, we do have the recording and we'll, we'll send that out to, to everyone. And of course, you can reach out directly to Lynn uh, for the reference list if you want to mm -hmm. do some of that additional reading. Um, and Lynn, I just want to thank you again for taking time with us today. Uh, I really appreciated your uh, unique perspective. You know, it's so clear that you, you've really found your passion in just the way that you talk about the research and kind of what you take away from it. And uh, I'm just so grateful for your presentation today. So thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, all of the, the folks who are on the line participating today. I specifically want to thank those of you who have donated to BU in the past. You know, your philanthropic support certainly makes programs like this possible. Uh, we do have two additional webinars coming up in the month of May, one on building innovative teams uh, and another on surviving a toxic work environment. Uh, and you can register today by visiting bu.edu slash alumni slash webinars. I'd also encourage all of you to check out our new alumni podcast. Uh, it's focused on um, 
you know, particularly interesting and accomplished alumni. It's called Proud to Be You, and you can find it wherever you find uh, your podcasts. Uh, and then if you aren't in the habit of downloading podcasts, you can also find it on our website, uh, bu.edu slash alumni slash podcast. And again, it's called Proud to Be You. As always, if you or any BU alumni that you know would be interested in presenting a professional development webinar, or if you have a topic that uh, you'd like to showcase for the Alumni Association, feel free to contact me in the Alumni Relations Office, and you can also email me at dangard, D-A-N-G-A-R-D, at bu.edu. Thanks again to everyone for your time, uh, and have a great day or a great evening, wherever you may be. Thanks again, Len. Yes, thank you.